Thanks, Anthony. I've got uh, 15 minutes and I'll try to stay on time. Lots to cover. Um, the, the first, I was asked to speak on two things, I think. One is international best practice and the customer experience. Um, I think I've got a couple of points that I need to make. First of all, there's many different kinds of rail access to airports, everything from trams to high-speed trains. They all do different things. They're not mutually exclusive. What makes sense at one place is really opportunistic. It's what you can do at each place. Usually you can't do all of them for, or even any of them for, for, for different reasons. The second thing is you need to um, understand who you're hearing advice from. Everybody, it's a regulated industry. There are lots of monopolies. Uh, and you, you know, everybody's entitled to be heard, but when an airline says something or when an airport operator says something, take it with a grain of salt and think about, well, why are they saying that and would they say that? Despite people saying that the airline industry never makes money, I think that's kind of like the rail industry never makes money. Lots of people make lots of money in the airline industry in some parts of it. Think about who's saying it and what they're saying. There's lots of myths and misunderstandings. One of the reasons for that is that most people don't actually fly that much. Most people fly once or twice a year. Even frequent business travelers usually fly from one airport in one city. Um, and for many years, that was me too. Uh, you can detect my accent, but at the moment, I've got live projects in Germany, Nigeria, and Toronto, uh, and Ottawa and Montreal. Uh, and in the last few years, I've been traveling a hell of a lot. Um, and I, sad person that I am, I've been to 174 airports and I've used the rail links at 47 of them as a passenger for a reason. I don't think any, anybody here want to take me on? I doubt it. <laughs> Hubbed at, more, at 30 airports, that was what I counted, 30, and that means hubbing. I hub long haul through Heathrow. Last uh, two weeks ago I was going down to Toronto for three days and I got a call on Sunday said, can you come to Lagos on Tuesday? And I said, well, I've got to be in Toronto on Wednesday, but yeah, I guess I can. And I, and, I, and I had to come back via Heathrow, no, via Frankfurt, because the, the hub through London was full. But I've hubbed through 30 airports, and I've thought about the airfares, because I buy my own tickets. I usually charge them to somebody else, but I know what the experience is in business class and in seat 56K. So I speak with some experience. Um, and, and I've built and operated uh, transport services to airports and worked on them for a lot of real clients, too. Um, so I'm not just an enthusiast, I think. Um, connectivity, really important. If the, air, if the rail link doesn't go where you want to go with maybe one change of train, most people will not use it. Forget it. It's just, it has to go where people want to go. So to say that you only get a certain share, well, yeah, but the railway only goes to a small part of the market. Um, speed and frequency are important. Sorry, frequency and reliability are probably more important than speed for airport travelers. People won't wait two hours for a long distance service, and they won't wait half an hour or an hour even for a short distance trip if there's another way to go. Price is very important at some segments of the market, but, an awful lot of, but a lot of people will pay an awful lot. They'll pay a lot more for an airport link than they logically should pay. You get people going on a budget holiday who will go on Heathrow Express and pay 22 pounds instead of paying, I don't know, six pounds on the Piccadilly line. Um, uh, I'm gonna go to quickly through Piccadilly line probably has carried more airport passengers than any other rail link in the world. It's slow, it's crowded, you have to compete with commuters for a seat, um, comfort's terrible, um, uh, and my sister used it last week because she didn't want to pay for a mini cab, and I said you just sit in the last car, get a book, stick in your headphones and grin and bear it for an hour and a half, it's still the best way to go. Um, and what people don't know is it was actually built, it makes money, makes an enormous operating profit for GFL. Michelle can correct me if I've misunderstood, but basically it generates six million passengers a year who fill empty seats on the other direction on the Piccadilly line. And as far as I can determine from the history books, London Transport paid for the extension. They built it to the central terminal with their own money. There was no government grant or, or anything like that, even as they kept running an airport bus as well, profitably for many years, for people who had lots of luggage and didn't want to go on the tube. It was a business. Um, they screwed it up a bit with Terminal 4. They should never built the loop to Terminal 4. They should have told BAA, if you want to build a terminal over there, that's your problem, but we're not going to build a loop and make all our trips four or five minutes longer to serve that dumb terminal over there. Sorry, uh, but I think you're agreeing with me. And, and they probably, and I think the long range plan is to abandon it actually because it totally screws up the service. People have to understand, it means that one in three Piccadilly line trains at Leicester Square goes where you want to go and the other two are going to Ricelip Gardens or Terminal 4. So, and I've almost missed planes because I've been dumb enough not to realize this myself. I've been on there at Leicester Square, Jesus, I've got to get to the airport and I've got to wait 15 minutes or maybe 20 minutes for my train. Heathrow Express, 
people, you know, every 15 minutes, but people know that and they're happy with it because it's fast. The price is eye-watering. I think it's just about the most expensive railway in the world per minute, no. per mile. No? no. Which one's which one's more expensive? Let's just go to Covent Garden. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that's true. That's true. Good point. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but it, again, it, it carries a small proportion of passengers, 12 percent. It's a very visible percentage. It's a great service. Um, I think it was funny, when I first got involved, I did work for BAA when they were planning it, and they said they didn't really want to build it because they didn't think it would make money. The uh, IRR on the investment really wasn't up to their, to their whack, um, and, uh, but they, I, I think that's probably not the case in retrospect. I find their, their marketing is brilliant. They get all these suckers who come off thinking it's the fastest way to central London and then discover it only gets them to Paddington. Um, and they sell you the ticket before you even get to the baggage hall, which is also brilliant. Um, uh, DLR, city airport, very different example. I think it's the second or third highest mode split in the world for a railway to an airport. I think it's about 50%. Nobody seems quite sure because they don't keep track of who are workers and commuters. It obviously appeals to a high end of the business market because the city airport is really just a business airport. Basically, the joke is, you know, the front of the plane lands at city airport and the back goes to Stansted. Um, but it's, it's very convenient. It's, it's fun being up in the air. It's, it's a nice ride. And for a business traveler coming from Stuttgart for a day's meeting in London, that or sitting in a taxi uh, on the Limehouse Link, I mean, I'd sit on the DLR any day. It's much more pleasant. Of course, it's not something people with a lot of luggage are going to want to do. And I think it's made the airport worth of close to a billion pounds last time it was sold. Um, so how much of that TFL got, I, I'm not sure, but probably not very much. Um, Frankfurt S-Bahn, a different service again. The S-Bahn system is sort of Thames Link and Crossrail combined. It all runs through a single tunnel through the middle of Frankfurt. They've got, I think, 16 different routes that connect into one with 30 trains an hour through the middle. What it means is you can get on the S-Bahn at Frankfurt Airport and be basically anywhere in the Frankfurt region or almost anywhere with one change of train. And the chances are that change of train will be cross-platform or same platform. It means you get on your train, and there's a train every 10 minutes from Frankfurt Airport. And I went down and looked at it last week when I was on my way to Lagos to London, because I'm a sad person. Uh, but they run through every 10 minutes. And not many people get on. Enough get on. Workers use it as well. But it gets you anywhere in the region. And if you don't have lots of bags, um, and you're traveling on your own, it's probably a good way to go. If you've got a family with kids and a lot of luggage, you're still going to take a taxi. Frankfurt Airport's got a big car park, it's next to a, an autobahn, it's got no speed limits, so you know, it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's just great transport, uh, and it's dirt cheap. Um, that's a close-up of it. It's an amazing system, and it's sort of what Crossrail and, uh, and uh, um, Thameslink will get us. The intercity is also amazing. Um, again, they have the high-speed rail line from Frankfurt to Cologne, passes through the airport basically. It's got this uh, nice high-speed station where almost every train stops. And you can get on the train there, or you can get on a regional train, and you could go just about anywhere in Germany by, again, one change of train. Um, the, uh, it, it makes Frankfurt the main airport for all of Germany. It's a bit odd because, of course, there's, Lufthansa is the only airline in Germany, so and, and Munich is sort of a hub in Frankfurt, but basically anybody in Germany who has to travel has a choice of either getting a connecting flight to a rival airport like Schiphol or Paris and changing, or getting on the train and going through Frankfurt. So it's, it's very important to make Frankfurt a key hub. As for the high-speed train, it's, it's a mind-blowing station. That's the station. It's a four-track station. It's like, this is Germany, you know, Stansted single-track tunnel into a little three-track platform station. This is a smaller airport. It's got this four-track station long enough for 16 car intercity trains. In comes a little S-Bahn train every half hour each way. And they get, I think, six high-speed trains a day that make the loop. Because even Deutsche Bahn couldn't be persuaded to route most of the trains in here. Because there's no market. So you've got to know if you're going to say we're going to have a rail link and put it on the high-speed network, and this applies to one or two of the proposals, I think, that are being discussed today, uh, you've got to believe that the operator is going to want to run the trains. And if uh, you know Frankfurt Airport doesn't fill the trains, it just happens to be on the route quarter of the people may get on and off some of the trains, but three quarters are riding through. And that's fundamental to the economics of the service. A better example, a better solution, I think, is what Newark Airport has and Dusseldorf. They got a, a, a shuttle connection to a station on the high speed line in Dusseldorf, the main line. It's not a high speed there, but it's the main line. And at Newark Airport, they have the same thing. In both cases, it's kind of a rinky dink people mover. Um, experimental, you might say. They're both monorails, one kind or the other. They have reliability problems, but most of the time they work. Um, they're not fast. 
Uh, the Newark one is painfully slow, but it still only takes 10 minutes, I think, and it gets you there. Um, and when you get there, you've got all the trains stopping. And it seems to me that for long distance train connections, that's much better than having only six trains a day like Dusseldorf. Um, that's the Newark connection. Gets you to Penn, Newark Penn Station, and there's three different routes to New York. It's the US, so it's not done very well because they don't do public transit very well, but it works. And it's still better than sitting in the Lincoln Tunnel in the morning rush hour while the taxi meter is running. The biggest terminal in the world, I think, is Shanghai Hongqiao Airport. That was 2006. That's 2010, that's 2012. It's gone from one runway to two runway. They built this enormous big new terminal on the other side. And the air's a bit foggy in China, as you point out, so even Google's not that good. That's the high-speed rail station. I think it's the biggest high-speed rail station in the world. I think it's got uh, 15 platforms, two runway airport, and basically all the high-speed trains in eastern China go through there and stop there. Uh, the Chinese managed to do two things wrong. Um, the first thing is they, they treat passengers like cattle and cargo. So you have to go, they've managed to turn it into an airport. You have to go through airport style security to then wait for an hour to get on your train. So why, why bother having a high speed train if everybody has to check in an hour early and go through airport style security? But it's sort of like what Eurostar do. The other thing they do that's um, uh, quite dumb, I don't know if I have a slide on it, is they've got two airports in Shanghai. Uh, one on the east side, one on the west side. And instead of saying this is the third biggest city in the world and we've got 100 or 80 million passengers a year, we can have two hub airports, one on each side. Some bureaucrats said, oh, we'll have the international flights stop at this airport and the domestic flights stop at this airport. So the domestic flights go through Hongqiao Airport, which is the one next to the railway. Except why would you fly on a domestic flight to then get on a high-speed train? You'd fly where you were going, surely. Yeah. So they've got the airports mixed up and they should either mix up the flights. I mean, this is, it took British Airways 30 years to change how they operated Heathrow, too, actually, with mixing Terminal 4 and Terminal 1. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's kind of dumb. They did try to build a high-speed rail line between the two. That's Pudong Airport. That's the international airport on the other side of Shanghai. That's the world's fastest train, except it only goes from Pudong Airport halfway, comes to downtown Shanghai. There is a subway line, a metro line, that takes you all the way through. I haven't, had, haven't been brave enough to spend my day doing that, because I think it takes an hour and a half. It's like the Piccadilly line. And what they actually recommend is you get on a bus to go from one airport to the other. So, you know, if you had to go to Wuhan and your travel agent was really dumb, they would book you on a high speed, on a flight to Shanghai, tell you to take the train to the other station and then get the bus. But nobody in their right mind would do that. You'd, you'd, you'd fly all the way, right? You'd, you'd get a new travel agent. That would be like hubbing between Gatwick and Heathrow, and I know people who've had to do that. Um, so you can't have two hubs. Well, obviously you can, because Newark does, New York does, um, a few places do, but to have competing hubs, multiple hubs, first of all, you have to have airlines that are going to put up with competition, and you have to have competitive ground transport links, which is why I'm talking about it here, because I was told not to talk about hubs. But that shows the size of the markets, uh, and I can give people, it's on the website if you want. JFK, Newark, similar markets. Newark is United's biggest hub. It's actually the second airport, but it has basically just as good links to central New York as JFK does, arguably better. Uh, and the same in Moscow, which has got two hubs owned by different companies, and they both have the same pretty lousy rail links to the city center. Um, so what does it mean? Well, it, the growth in London airports is enormous, and people have to look at the numbers. You can't talk about solutions without understanding the numbers. Just as there's no point saying we're going to have intercity rail service and then discover it's going to be six trains a day like Dusseldorf, you also can't say I'm going to build a new hub up airport out in the middle of somewhere and it's all going to be on a high speed train line, but there's only going to be four slots a day. And I saw the work from Foster's that came in this week and they've got an awful lot of trains coming out of their new airport and you need it because you look at Heathrow, it's got four motorways to it, six motorways. It's got both M3 coming both ways, the M25 coming both ways, the M4 coming both ways, and really sort of the M40. You need an awful lot of road capacity for a big airport. And the growth has to be on, um, the growth has to be on rail, one thinks, because you don't think you're gonna get permission to widen the M2 to 16 lanes, or the A13 to 16 lanes. I'm almost finished, Anthony. Good. Um, so, but the rail numbers are also enormous, and this is looking at the rail numbers for a new London hub and say, well, okay, we might get 40% car mode split. We might get it down that low, but, but frankly, getting a driver taking the airport is the best way, and it's actually the way I guess I do it most of the time too, and it's what most people are gonna want. But you stick an airport a long way from anywhere, more people will use rail, but you're, then you're gonna have an awful lot of rail passengers, and if you add them up, you're gonna need an awful lot of trains and an awful lot of tracks. Um, so, 
I think I've covered all these points. Um, basically, each rail service means one less motorway lane. And unless you want to build a 16 lane motorway to your new airport, you're going to want as many trains as you can. But they've got to go to different places. They've got to be different kinds. You've got to think them through and think about whether people will really use them. And the train operators will really want to run the trains on them to make money. Um, and yes, be wary of loops. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael.